not and tell us that you have not lusted after any woman for a preacher to be offended that another preacher comes out and say if i have touched any woman the woman should cry out you need to know that we're in the last he was offended for that it means we're in the last day there's no preacher on this earth who has not committed adultery he has been lustful before and i'll prove that to you so relax I guess by now you have seen the controversy that concerns the person of Pastor John Anosike, Apostle Arome Osai, and Prophet Ubert Angel. Of course, we are very familiar with Apostle Arome Osai and Ubert Angel in the past. But I think one way or the other, Pastor John Anosike has made it to a table of discussion as to controversies of things happening in the church. One teacher that had claimed himself to be a teacher gave a challenge. If you're a man of God, You've never slept with another woman. Come, come out and say it. I can say it boldly. Really? And I have an issue with all of them on this particular trend. Now, how did it start? Was it here? I boasted. And I said, any woman that you know that I've slept with you before, go to Facebook and cry. Shout. <laughs> I challenge every pastor to do that. That stirred up the internet. I know I'm gonna play all of them for you, but just for those who follow Being Real George and are hearing this for the first time, I need to give them context. I don't care what his previous histories were. This man called on the name of Jesus. He preached Christ. He led millions of people to Christ. He helped people. He didn't build a one billion sitters church. Rather, he used money and helped the less privileged. So, when it comes to his stance on quote-unquote holiness, quote-unquote morals, of course, he's one preacher that I've heard come out and say practically that I married my wife a virgin. Hold on, because when it comes to everyone's moral compass, I think it should have to be according to the word of God. Because we might have different moral compasses ourselves, but in the end, our righteousness is like what? Mm -hmm. But it doesn't mean that you should not strive to live rightly in the sight of God and man. So what happened? Let me just play the full video for you to get the context. I can say it boldly. Say really? Look at that is boast pride from the pit of hell. Because that's your filthy righteousness. And it does not amount to anything before God. Because even though you think you have not done it, it is by his grace and righteousness that empowered you not to but here's my take in such type of nonsense words my take there is if you claim you have not done it physically have you done it in your imaginations come out and tell us that you have not lusted after any woman jesus told us what real fornication is so maybe no one has told you that if you have not committed it physically, you have committed it in your thoughts. You have committed it in your eyes. Oh, he says, if any man lusts after a woman, he has committed fornication. So, sir, you are still guilty of the same thing. Instead of preaching Christ, you are preaching yourself. You ask yourself a question. So, how did you know about what Apostle Aramo said? Probably because there are blogs here and there or platforms here and there that get to re-echo what pastors say. There are many of them. So probably he came across one of the videos and he had an issue with that. But where I found very, very disturbing is the way he gets to address a person of Apostle Ramosai. One teacher that had claimed himself to be a teacher. Meaning that he has known about him, of course, before. And addressing him that way was quite disturbing. Listen to this yourself. One teacher that had claimed himself to be a teacher. To the brother that is watching out for me and he doesn't want me to enter into error, is this. Number one, I will never apologize for my stand of holiness in the body of Christ till my dying day. Second response is that your expectation about my fall, you will never see it in this lifetime. And the statement I've made is not drawn from a sense of personal strength, but an understanding of the covenant of God that makes the grace of God available. 
if God will not change, if the quality of the grace of God does not change, if my conviction and pursuit will not change, you only see me born brighter and better. And I'll be a more blazing example of the spirit of holiness in the name of Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, I, that's my response. I just had to. Now, Pastor John Onesike, in case you're watching this, I know you have a particular pattern when it comes to bringing down videos and doing all of those things you do behind the scenes. This is an analysis. So we are discussing it, of course, on level pegging for everyone. So now. Let's look at John Anosike first. Then from John Anosike, we get to move to Hubert Angel. Then we deal with the elephant in the room towards the end, Apostle Aaron Mosai. This particular now, subject here, what he's saying as his rebuttal for Apostle Aaron Mosai, aside his prophecy of him, I wouldn't say it's a prophecy, but his idea of him probably falling or something. Instead of preaching Christ, you are preaching yourself. Yeah, I have not done my man again. I'm giving a challenge. So you are... That man will fall. It's a matter of what? Time. Because he has spoken arrogantly. Grace will be depleted. Mark my words. It's a matter of time. It might delay because he will hear it. This part one now will come out and he will hear it. And then he will fight not to go. But he will. Because there's a way, except he comes out publicly and apologizes. Something will be lifted from you to humble you. You don't take pride in your self-righteousness to challenge other men of God. You don't do that. That is completely filthy, prideful, and unrighteousness. It's unrighteous. God can purge man. God can cleanse man. Are you hearing me? A murderer became the greatest apostle of the time. And note, Apostle Aromo Sai said himself that he boasted. See here, he boasted. We'll look at that when we get to his own section. So you should now start thinking and start typing. What does the Bible say about boasting? Note that as well. Again, okay. talking about the fact of pride and then, you know, for such people, their time is just a matter of time. If you read Proverbs 11, it says, When pride comes, then comes disgrace, but with the humble is wisdom. Note what I'm saying right here, with the humble is is wisdom. I think Apostle Aramosai didn't speak wisely, even though what he said is not sinful. Again, when we get to Apostle Aramosai, we'll discuss about him in that context. So that is it for Pastor John Anosike. You could tell me what you think about that as well, because his personality as well, when it comes to the way, come on, Anosike himself claims that he's an oracle. This month's salary is your first fruit of the year. It is for me, not for church. Is for the if, if it is for this order, it is for this oracle. Are you hearing me? It is for this vessel, this one God has prepared. It is for my welfare. If you honor me with the, the first fruit of your first year, by the middle of this year, if you don't testify, come back, I'll give back to you. But again, that is it for his side. Looking at the person of Prophet Ubad Angel, now him coming to speak about that as well, look at the way he gets to address it. Someone came in and said, you know what? Um, I've never cheated on my wife, ever. Um, sir, Jesus did not talk about you sleeping with the wife. No. Jesus said, if you look at a woman to last after it, you have already done this physical act spiritually. Just mm. looking. And the spirit is more tangible to God than the natural. Mm. The natural is a shadow. Mm. So a man who sleeps with a woman physically and a man who does commit adultery with his eyes, the one who does with his eyes is worse than the physical one. Mm. Wow. The spiritual is more powerful than the natural. Yes, that's true. That's, true. true. that's why Jesus said if you so look at a woman, to last after you commit adultery. Mm. Mm. There's no preacher on this earth who has not committed adultery. Mm. If not physically, with your eyes you did. Mm. Yes, this, these members in our churches mm. are being lied to. Mm. So they will follow us thinking, we, we, I'll just be like our man of God. Mm. Then after two months they realize, wait a minute, mm. it's not working. Mm. This might be just a superman, I'm not. No sir, no ma'am. No, that's why God gave grace 
That's why Jesus died on the cross. He knows you can't do it. You needed Jesus, not me. Jesus. If you follow me and study me, you will fail. I'm an exam and a test you can pass. But study Jesus, you go to heaven. If you study you be the angel, you will fail. Because you be the angel fails. Now you saw the angle he came from and say that all ministers, of course, have committed adultery. What was the ground of him saying that? He's saying that based on what Jesus himself said in red in print in your Bible. But sometimes I wonder because if you have done biblical hermeneutics or probably you do proper scriptural exegesis, you know when something is literal and when something is figurative. Let me ask you a question. The scripture itself says that he who looks at a woman lustfully has committed adultery with her in his heart. So when a single man looks at a single woman, what has happened? No, for those of you that take scriptures literally. Ah, no, no, tell me what has happened. Because you have to understand the intent of that which Jesus is trying to communicate more than just the literal writing of what you see because if you are taking that to be that literally now i'm discussing scriptures then why have you not cut out your arm and unplugged your eye and other things that of course that is said down there in the same scripture what jesus was trying to teach is going to come to what i'm going to be discussing right now as well looking at the heart the mind lost in a compendium Jesus is trying to make us understand something in scripture that I think is very, very fundamental when it comes to our work with God. When the Bible says that your mind is the battlefield, see, Jeremiah talks about the heart itself is indeed very, very desperate. Whatever you put your heart to, if you get to the point whereby your heart overrides your mind, that is the battlefield, through constant meditation and pondering to a great extent my dear you get to lose your mind override into actions that will lead you away from god or lead you astray people say a believer cannot sin i just look at them i laugh i say oh god that would be us looking at maybe uh grace amplified right now when it comes to the theology of that let me try to break this down remember like i always tell you guys attention is equals to currency so when i say that you know that whatever you have your attention in is something that is current in your mind don't just think about money okay so whatever you have your attention in is very current in your mind okay good when it comes to the subject of lust lust itself breeds desire but before you get to the point of having a desire, you need to have attention. And then from the person's attention, what breeds then in your heart will now become the desire. It is from desire itself that then breeds or equates itself to lust. So from the point of there being an attention, that acknowledgement that, okay, this person does exist, there has to be a movement from the existentiality of that particular person to the point whereby you now begin to desire the person, which then equates to lust. I'm going to give you examples with Aromo Osa himself, which correlates to the challenge or the challenge that uh, Anosike put to him, because that particular challenge Anosike put to him, Aromo Osa cannot actually defend himself on that particular challenge because he has been lustful before. And I'll prove that to you, so relax. So we need to ask you what you are hungry for, because that's your hunger. Is going to be a handle that Satan will use to manipulate your possibilities and your fortune. In the book of Zechariah chapter 3, we see a scenario in court. Are you with me? Yes, sir. Oh, I was on my knees in prayer. You know, I was in public service before I came into ministry full time, not too long ago. So, you will find senior officers on the field. They will go to support staffs and ask them if i can touch your breast and i give you fifty thousand ah, the baby sir what is it is it not touch ah you see that's how easily you think that the activity ended with the touching and to get fifty thousand <laughs> uh, yeah. 
Satan has borrowed, Satan has secured an argument from that transaction. And you might be wondering why your promotion has not come. Why your breakthrough has not come. Even though you are in the place of prayer every day. It is because Satan used your appetite for money as a means of control. And if Satan can control you, it means Jesus is not the Lord of your life. A few years ago, I was on my knees. And I was just talking to God and talking to God. And then God just decided to cast my mind back. He casted my mind back to a time where I was working in Lagos. And um, because we already had a ministry in Bengal State, if I go to Lagos with my wife and my family, it will look as if I've left. So I had to ask my wife to, it's not as if she was an ordained minister then, but I had to ask her to stay over in Bengal State so that I'll be going and coming. Let it be an evidence of the fact that my heart has not left the field of mission. So when I was in Lagos, I was there alone. So in the office, there is this lady that used to come sell perfume. She's like a jellyfish. She has bleached the first layer of her skin and she's in between white and yellow. I don't know, almost invisible on the on the scale. Uh, well, the Lord will give you understanding. So, <laughs> hallelujah. So this lady was determined to make me her customer. In the, the product she's even selling, I'm not seeing it. So you now discover that they are the primary products, they are tertiary products. And uh, as the case may be. I was on my knees not too long ago and the Lord now revealed, he, he took my mind back that if by any means you had anything to do with this lady, this season that you have entered today would not have been in view at all because the accuser are you there? Yes. That event did not just happen. The scenario was not just created. It was calculated by a lawyer a barrister an ancient son that understands the pendulum of justice and the nature of our God, his commitment to his nature as a righteous judge. He knows that God. Since you were without spot and wrinkle, you will be able to fulfill the destiny that God has placed over your life. So we need to make you a bit rough. And so Satan will bring his products and advertise them before your face. In my case, this was a lady that was between yellow and white. Satan knows you're lost. He knows that you like fair women. The ones that will come to test you will not be black. You were born in. You used to need prayer those days. People were falling. Today, <laughs> it's you that you have you you are falling. Because we have an accuser, and the accuser is bent on creating scenarios that will make his case, his contention, prosper in the court of heaven. Hallelujah. So she on Monday she will come with the products and then smile and say, Oh God. <laughs> I go sell him a canto in my say Kalua. So I was not hearing the Oga. Then second week again on Monday she'll be by the door. Oh God. It was after two months that the Oga now started entry. Do you understand what I'm the Oga continued until after two months. Huh? Then you now notice, okay, there's somebody talking. And the way I have trained myself is this. I hope you know, those of you that know how a keno is, it's not the water that is around the keno that makes it sink. It's the one that enters inside. The moment you notice that there is something has entered inside your heart, you no longer need the thing to happen for you to remember the thing. It's already inside. The Oga is already inside. Oga, 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 Oga. When you notice something has entered, that's when you need to commit abortion. Yeah, you need to. There is an intensive care unit of the grace and the mercy of God in Jesus Clinic. Jesus Clinic is a place where patients that recognize their condition they go and take admission. They go on admission by themselves. It's not on the advice of a doctor. You just diagnose your condition and know that you are vulnerable. Then you go and take drip. If you have not been visiting there, uh, as we go on in the teaching, you will see many points. Uh, oh, why do you think uh, uh, powerful? You have not heard of so many powerful men of God in Nigeria. Is it that God is not anointing? What of you? Why do we in the, on campus? There was an anointing on your head now. Where is it now? 
So the moment I knew that I had conceived, the voice of that lady had created conception in my soul. So even though the lady is not around, her voice is left in my soul. So I knew that I was in trouble. Because this time there was water inside the boat. So I took it to this I admitted myself on the first bed in Jesus Clinic and put drip. And the nurses came and conducted our abortion and took that loss out of my soul. So when I knew that I was at war, whenever the lady comes again, I'll be speaking in tongues. In my heart, Aiko Sali, Amako Ikelea. You'll be wondering, you say, Oh, you are too spiritual. Oh. <laughs> 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 And while I was on my knees, I'd forgotten it. I'd finished from Lagos. In fact, I've re resigned. And I'm in full-time ministry now. On my knees, just engaging God. And God told me, He just showed me a picture. That if you had anything to do with this woman, what you are enjoying now wouldn't have been in view at all. Because the voice of the accuser will cloud the heavens, cloak the heavens. And in keeping with my nature of justice, judgment, and equity, it would have been difficult for me to release my good pleasure concerning your life. Desire being equals to lust only finds expression in the heart. Until you understand the heart and mind connection, what I'm saying now may sound to you like tautology. But note, I'm not saying that Jesus saying that he who looks at a woman lustfully has committed adultery with her in her heart means that it does not apply to single people. That's not what I'm saying. If you read 1 Corinthians 6 from verse 9 to 11 and 18, you get to even see what the scriptures talks about, what the scriptures talks about sexual sin. But I just wanted to point that to you if you have ever even thought of that in that angle. So. If you look at the person of Hubert Angel talking about, you know, looking at a woman lustfully, and it is not literal. What Jesus is trying to teach there is that before there becomes an action, there has to be a thought which would, of course, lead to a desire, which, of course, would lead to what? The action. So you even thinking of it is as though you have performed the action. Because what happens is that when there is a premeditation, which happens in the heart itself, giving it that room to even breathe in your heart. When there is that premeditation, what happens is that it becomes easier for you to fall into the act itself. But where there is no premeditation, where there is no room for it to even have life in you, what happens is that the act itself more of life becomes non-existent. Hence, you have to know this very important like James 1 verse 14 says. You are tempted by your desire based on the meditations of your heart and influences for which you have those becomes the root of that which gets to tempt you so the point i'm trying to make here in summary is that so jesus is addressing the root cause of the physical experience that happens when it comes to sexuality so is lost itself a sin of course it is it now depends on how you are able to define the state of which you are in. Are you at the point of thought, which is more of like maybe you look at someone and you're acknowledging the person is, oh, you are beautifully and wonderfully made. Has it graduated from the point of just a thought to a point of there being a desire? Because a thought means that this particular thing has caught your attention. It's normal to for someone you see to have your attention. Just like Apostle Romosai will come and say, um, my, Mr. Macaroni is a strange man because when it comes to his videos, we discussed about it before, looking at him and Pastor Bology, that his videos are centered around lust and all that. We discussed that. And I was asking you in that video, for him to watch Mr. Macaroni's video, either by chance or by mistake, and see that his videos are portraying lustfulness, that caught his attention for him to notice that but again there's a step from something having your attention or someone having your attention to the point of there being a desire there's a thin line between that do you understand so Hubert Angel saying that every man of God has committed adultery he's just telling you about himself in that process so he's putting everyone in the shoe that he is in the same thing probably with what is angering Pastor Anosike. Let's look at the person of Apostle Aramosai. I guess you watched the video of Apostle Aramosai responding to Pastor John Anosike. In fact, uh, 
Pastor John Anosike, you know you are a pastor, right? <laughs> this is one, what one, uh, uh, another, <laughs> God. Inside what, I haven't spoken about it before. This is what they said about pastors. So if you're, if you're, if your pastor is a pastor, <laughs> this is what they say about you. Because you bring a curse on yourself. Are you hearing what I'm saying? It's not your profession. So let's look at prophets, genuine prophets who see in the spirit, who know things. Let them talk. So if you can give me three prophets on this earth who see and who travel in the spirit to say what you are saying, I, I can now begin to believe you. But if it's pastors that are talking, pastors are in the last cadre of the fivefold ministry. They should keep quiet. They should what? They should keep quiet. Apostles, prophets. Huh? So you keep quiet. You're a pastor. You don't all you do is shepherding sheep. We deal with God. You deal with sheep. So you can continue to take care of sheep. Five ways to take care of your sheep. Three ways to make people come to your church. You know, you can deal with that. We we talk to God. And we hear from God. You know nothing about hearing from God. So keep quiet. Let those who hear from God talk about the things of God. Uh -huh. So Pastor Nozike, you don't have level though. Uh -huh. This one is apostle. Apostle and prophet are talking. You, pastor, you come and talk. Oh, no. I let me not. Did I say anything? Shebi is another pastor that. You see, all of these things you are saying, what, what points are you getting from what I'm showing you here? When you get to the point of preaching self, I believe is that he may be known. Not that I may be known. You understand? That's why I don't come here and say I'm trying to show pro -wiz. I do analysis, I forget and I move on. I don't... You see, because I understand the heart very well. Anytime I'm even watching my video, that's why I had to get this cap. I should be reminded of what is the state of my heart. I tell you, don't... One of the things you should not carry in your heart, okay, is people or make people a subject or like the cares of your heart itself being you having a situation with someone so every time as well i'm always conscious about what is the state of your heart at the point of doing this what is the state of your heart you might be saying now i'm attacking this people attacking attacking but i'm speaking facts i don't have any sentiments i don't care which camp you belong to people even say that i almost i pays me i say whoa <laughs> so the defense that Apostle Ramosai gives for him, for what he said, he talked about the person of Prophet Samuel. Uh, in, in the book of 1 Samuel chapter 12, 1 Samuel chapter 12, verse 1. And Samuel said unto all Israel, Behold, I have hearkened unto your voice in all that ye said unto me, and have made a king over you. And now behold, the king walketh before you, and I am old and gray-headed, and behold, my sons are with you, and have walked before you from my childhood until this day. Behold, here am I, witness against me before the Lord, and before his anointed. Whose ox have I taken? Or whose ass have I taken? Or whom have I defrauded? Whom have I oppressed? Or of whose hand have I received any bribe? To blind my eyes therewith, and I will restore it to you. This is sad. The prophet Samuel he was about to come to the end of his ministry and he was compelled to do a strange thing he brought himself under the scrutiny of the people that he judged by his calling as a prophet in the land and he asked a few questions the question is, is this man doing this out of pride? Was it a sense of piety? 
a sense of sanctimony that was his motivation behind these questions that he was making bare before the children of Israel was it pride his work with God in secret and in public has been an open book and because he was sure of his integrity he didn't consider it a threat for him to do this before the entire assembly how many people can that are preachers can come before their congregation and say whose whose daughter did i touch you know what i am sure of my integrity and that's why i did this in south africa i say hey if there is any woman among you that i laid hand on let the woman cry out i found it from the life of samuel you are not fit for the pulpit if you are an extortioner you use the grace and the office that God has made available to you as a means of escorting things from people you are not fit for the pulpit and in the words of Samuel I want to ask if there is anybody in this immediate congregation or around the world for that matter that I extorted something from in the practice of ministry that person too has liberty to cry out the example that i have for this is samuel in the old testament i also have new testament examples for a preacher to be offended that another preacher comes out and say if i have touched any woman the woman should cry out you need to know that we're in the last he was offended for that it means we're in the last days. We're in the last days where people will make effort to try to legitimize things that are outlawed. His offense was not that I touched a woman and I'm, and I'm trying to hide it. His offense was that I have come to do what Samuel is doing because I'm sure of my integrity. Anointed, it makes you very, very attractive. I have had to deal with the pressure of attraction all these years till this time and I'm saying that I touched no woman. <laughs> Hallelujah. And meanwhile I'm not saying this as a local champion. I have gone round the nations of the world. I know the difference between an Egyptian woman and an Ethiopian woman. May the Lord give you understanding. <laughs> the man asked, is there anyone that I oppressed in the administration of my office? Is there anyone that gave me a bribe in order to blind my eyes to facts? Do you realize that when this day of reckoning came, Samuel did not talk about the volume and the weight of anointing that he stewarded? The issue was based on character. Think about it. Are you there? All right, let me give you a support scripture. Acts chapter 20, verse 33. Okay. Now let's begin from 32. It says, And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified I have coveted no man's silver huh. nor gold nor what apparel I did not use the advantages of my office to extort I did not use the advantages that were available to me on the account of the high calling to urge a man from his wife he said i have coveted no man's silver i coveted no man's gold i have coveted no man's apparel the list goes on i have coveted no man's wife i have coveted no man's daughter are you there I was hoping, I was thinking that the Church of Jesus will celebrate that um, 
the culture of holiness is coming back and the integrity is being factored around the pulpit again. I never knew it would be an object of controversy for someone to present himself as an object of public scrutiny because he has a public ministry. I never thought that will be at the basis of grievance. May the Lord help us in the name of Jesus Christ. Now, in order to finally clear your doubts on the position of scriptures on this matter, we need to go into the lecture notes of Apostle Paul, the lecture notes he presented to his son in ministry, giving him an insight into the qualifications of eldership. Eldership. So the word elder and the word bishop in the Bible are one and the same. A bishop or an elder is someone that is given the responsibility of supervising souls. A deacon, the office of the diaconate, is someone that is given the responsibility of administering kingdom affairs. If it has to do with administration, that is the office of the deacon. If it has to do with oversight of souls, it is touching the office of an elder. Are you there? Okay, come with me. Now, it says in verse 1, this is a true saying, if a man desired the office of a bishop, he desired a good work. If you check this scripture, you will see that the bishopric is not a title. According to scripture, it is a work. Second thing, it says in verse number 2, it says a bishop must be blameless. That's where I'm coming. A bishop, in order for you to qualify to oversee souls, you must be flawless in your character. People that have character issues are not recommended for the bishopric. Your relationship with Jesus Christ and your interfacing with the grace of God must be so rich that the grace of God uh, flourishes and prospers in your life through your commitment to the Holy Ghost in the fact that your character becomes reflective of a man that is truly regenerated so we can trust you with dealings that have to do with the souls of men I'd like you to understand that the requirement of bishopric is higher than what is needed for political office holding because this guy is dealing directly with the souls of men and it is possible for him to to command these stones these lively stones and make them bread he can convert you see the authority and the office that he has gives him a lot of influence over the lives of men directly he can be the reason why people will be turned to hell. His life can be the reason. So it is a very sensitive role. And in order for you to qualify to play that role, and I'd like you to go back and read from verse 1 to verse 12, the, the first requirement for eldership is that an elder must be flawless in character. That can only happen if Jesus Christ is your unique goal and the object of your pursuit. So this is scripture. What I did now is just scripture. So my response, therefore, to the brother that is watching out for me and he doesn't want me to enter into error, is this. Number one, I will never apologize for my stand of holiness in the body of Christ till my dying day. Second response is that your expectation about my fall, you will never see it in this lifetime. And the statement I've made is not drawn from a sense of personal strength, but an understanding of the covenant of God that makes the grace of God available. If God will not change, if the quality of the grace of God does not change, if my conviction and pursuit will not change, you will only see me born brighter and better. Amen. And I'll be a more blazing example of the spirit of holiness in the name of Jesus. 
the Lord and his anointed one are my witnesses today. Samuel declared that my hands are clean. But know something that he said right here. Tell me and I will make right whatever I have done wrong. That itself there is humility. The Bible can be used to defend anything. Look at what we have been arguing about first fruits. Even Anosike said that he is an oracle. In fact, your first fruit belongs to him. He came out and said that he's talking to his audience. So he's not talking to all of you that are on the internet. You understand? Just that I'm just wondering, him coming to come and respond to Aaron Mosai, probably because Aaron Mosai said he's challenging other pastors, challenge them to also do the same thing. But note as well, Aaron Mosai challenge other pastors both those who are in rcn and those outside rcn you know recently kesiana I, I i love that brother he has been saying i don't know he has been doing a lot of confessions when he was in fellowship how he did this how you have seen all of those videos i don't want to talk about those ones at least so that before somebody tomorrow come out and say reverend kesiana did this with me he has already said himself I me mean, i see all of these things as public confession so that at least you get to know a man and I, I love his ministry to a lot to a great extent i would say myself but back to the person of apostle aramos he's talking about him compared to all other pastors in rcn outside rcn nowhere did samuel himself talk about the subject he's talking about that is number one if you are thinking of it logically but samuel himself was not comparing himself to anyone even though apostle aramos was more like challenging other pastors and making that comparison. Do you understand? So that itself does not really agree to the, his defense for using that particular scripture or where he learned that from. But you can say that when it comes to his public declaration to his congregation, those who follow him as well, of course, he's right. In that context, he's right to do so. Coining that from that scripture, speaking publicly, if I have ever come out and shout. But please tell me as well. Yeah, because if you understand that he married his wife a virgin, of course, where, where is your record? Where would you, you know? He's justified by his statement in that particular regard. Just that if you now have to dig deeper contextually, it does not get to rhyme. Because someone was not comparing himself to anybody based on the context of scripture there. Because that was actually a build up to something else, which if you read down through scripture, why he did that, you will also get to understand as well. When it comes to... You know but let's not go deeper into that so that is one aspect number two as well we have to look at the scriptures when the bible talks about boasting we are only as christians should be boasting in the lord in in, in corinth this was also an issue the situation of superiority that was also something happening in the corinthian church and that's what is happening right now as well in the body of christ where you see Hubert and Joe say that he's among the prophets, prophets. You know, Hubert and Joe will come and say there are only how many prophets. <laughs> see, I'll tell you honestly, Moa, I know they see you, I know they see you now like that, so I go tell you not true. But make a no disturb uh, the, uh, my papa, my papa. That's why I don't really come out plainly on some things, because if I have to come out and deal with some things, it's when I'm showing you Bible, that's when you cannot... <laughs> But I just tell you, say me, I only see you like that. But you see this whole sense of superiority that is happening in the body of Christ. And it's mainly, first of all, based on the attention and the relevance you have, whether you like it or not. Yes, you will not see just somebody that has uh, how many followers or how many this or just started ministry yesterday to come and say, I am the greatest, I am the this. Come on. How many times have we seen, oh God. So the point I'm trying to show you right here is that this is when people now start preaching self. What does the scripture itself say about boasting? This was what was happening in Corinth. In the context, Paul was just defending his authority. But look at what he has to say right here. Verse 9 says, I am not trying to frighten you by my letters. For some, for some say Paul's letters are demanding and forceful. But in person, he is weak and his speeches are worthless. Those people should realize that our actions when we arrive in person will be a force, as forceful as what we say in our letters from far away. Verse 12. Oh, don't worry. We wouldn't dare say that we are as wonderful as these other men who tell you how important they are but 
they are only comparing themselves with each other using themselves as the standard of measurement how ignorant some christians will say how unwise now even though what even though what um apostle ramos himself did said is not wrong but comparing yourself to one to the other it's just an unwise thing to do so where i think he's wrong there is him saying that he's challenging other pastors now i understand he's more of like bringing a stand for holiness uprightness and all that and things like this that has caught the attention of the web when it comes to his utterance and you now see pastors responding to him directly indirectly and calling him names should also make him more steadfast you understand and i i i i think to a great extent this is just a case of upon sharpening iron but upon iron sharpening iron does that the way this one is not like really iron sharpening iron it's as if like uh, either wood is trying to cut iron or be iron is trying to cut bronze because in this case right here you could see the difference between these three people and their issues with one another from the way they get to sound and Hubert and Joe sees himself, of course, as father. You know, these are people that he prophesied to come to pass and all that. Aromo Osai's response, of course, he was expecting people to celebrate when it comes to his stance for holiness and all that. I think no one would want to. You, you don't expect other pastors for you to make that kind of statement, of which many pastors, I will tell you for a fact, when it comes to their moral standing, hey, yeah, God, me, I'm tired. See, those of you that are sending i am tired of, of the stories i've seen a lot i've heard a lot right now when it comes to proof of ministry it's always either how long you have been in ministry or would i say uh how many private jets you have or how many branches you have but when it comes to moral standing it is not something that is obviously being discussed and that is where i appreciate the person of aroma Osai himself triggering and stirring the waters on this conversation because when it comes to moral standing, it's more of like it doesn't really have a place right now in even when it comes to Christianity, like it's deep. Look at what you have been looking at the person of TV Joshua recently, like think about that. Of course, I know CK himself, you see, like I told you in my last video before this one, based on TV Joshua's documentary and things that have come out about him, has created a demarcation for you to know who your pastor is and who your, who your pastor is for real based on their support or defense the ones that are quiet of course they should be quiet but now you get to see the clear divide as well when it comes to and these kind of things of course gets to bring division but division would always remain of course in the body of christ that is a fact this is itself right here would bring that demarcation there has to be a separation from the goats and the sheep. But of course, there's a place in scripture that talks about letting them grow together and then there will be a separation. But even at that as well, at least you can see that even though everybody is growing together, you can see where the, the wheat and the tares are. You can see the goats and the sheep. Either way, it just depends on you yourself asking yourself, am I a goat or am I a sheep? Because that is very important. It's not defined by who you follow. It's defined by your own work with God which is very, very optimal.